Let's pull that back. Maybe that's the strangest one you've ever heard. But the strangest one I've ever heard. And he was a second career pastor, which means he had been employed doing something else. He had, a, he had another full-time job or career before he, he was trying to get his call of ministry. And, and, uh, and he, his, his message was his call to ministry. He talked about, on Easter Sunday, his message was describing his call to ministry. And I thought, this is really strange. Why in the world is, is he doing this? I'm critical even in those days. Why, why in the world is he doing this? But by the end of the worship service, I knew that I knew that God, through the Holy Spirit, was speaking to my heart. That I was to become a full-time, ordained clergy person in the United Methodist Church. I just knew beyond a shadow of a doubt. And, I, and so when we got back to Linda's parents' house, I got my nerve up and I asked Linda to come with me. And I kind of took her aside away from everybody else. We went back into the back bedrooms and I sat her down and I said, Linda, I've got to, I've got to tell you something. I said, at this worship service, I, do, I, I know that that's what God's calling me to do. I know he's calling me to become a full-time ordained clergy person in Methodist Church. And she looked at me and calmly said, I wonder when you're finally going to figure that out. <laughs> so apparently the Holy Spirit has spoken to her before. Now, you can ask Phil or you can ask Mike Smith uh, about the process for becoming a clergy person in the United Methodist Church. It's long, it's hard, it's... Uh, the word arduous comes to mind. Uh, it's tough. <coughs> it, it's it's a, a very difficult procedure. Uh, when uh, when uh, Mike or Mike is, uh, Smith is still going through it, because let you know how long and hard it is. And Phil is getting ready to begin it, uh, and he hasn't even started seminary yet. Um, but uh, it it was it's a little different. It was a little different for me than it, than it, it is or was for them, uh, but not a lot different. But the difference makes a difference in, in, in this story because when I went through, the first thing I did was go talk to my pastor and I told him about my call. Well, he had me go in front of the uh, Pastor Parish Relations Committee and talk to them and they agreed with me that, that it sounded like I, I had a call to ministry. So then the charge conference approved me as a candidate and then I got my mentor. That explained to me the process. And you hear where this is going, where the God can give you something. He might not tell you exactly what the sacrifices are before you, you agree to do the thing. Um, I had already been through this whole thing and really sold out that this is what God wanted me to do before I found out that I needed a 96 credit master's degree to be ordained. Remember, I had dropped out of school after one year out of college, after one year, been married for five years, at six years at this point, but just about. Uh, two kids under the age of six just bought a house, and now I'm finding out in order to follow what I believe to be God's will for my life, I have to go back to school, finish my bachelor's, and get a 96 credit master's to be ordained. If I had known that process and then went to the worship service and heard that man preach, it, I might have thought I had indigestion, but I know I wouldn't have thought that God was going to be ordained ministry. Happening here with the disciples. They're being called into this relationship with Jesus, but he's waiting until they receive the power of the Holy Spirit in order for them to be able to handle what's going on, what's going to be called upon them as uh, in the future. That was four pages of those. Thank you. 
true disciples of Jesus Christ. We don't want to hear the, the scriptures about taking up our cross and following Jesus and what that implies and, and what it means. We're unprepared to comprehend that Jesus really did mean for us to turn the other cheek. It wasn't just something he said. He really did mean for us to love our enemies. And if we're followers of Jesus, we're supposed to be doing that. He really did mean to pray for those who despise us. It wasn't just words, but truly following after Jesus Christ. He did, really did mean to redistribute, redistribute our wealth to give to those who are less fortunate than us. Not just a uh, political plank, but the word from God. It's not until the Holy Spirit of truth comes into our lives and guides us into all truth that we finally begin to understand what it really means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. The spiritual giants of our faith got this. They understood that it meant more than simply mouthing the words that Jesus Christ is Lord, but it meant receiving the Holy Spirit that allows you to, to sacrifice for God, for God's ways. Bonhoeffer, one of the spiritual giants, wrote The Cost of Discipleship. It's a powerful book if you ever get a chance to read it, but it really talks about what I'm talking about today, that discipleship is costly. It may be a free gift of God to be forgiven from our sins, but if we're going to follow after Jesus, we need the Holy Spirit. We need that spirit that Jesus promised that will lead us into all truth and that will strengthen us for service with God. Discipleship is costly. Bonhoeffer died in a Nazi prison camp roughly two or three days before the end of the war. They, made, they knew that the war was going to end and they got rid of him before he could, be, he could be set free. He was a Christian a pastor who stood against the Nazi, Nazis' treatment of the Jews and spoke out verbally against the, the regime and, and therefore was, was thrown in, in, into, the, uh, into the concentration camps. Mother Teresa understood what it meant as a spiritual giant, powered by the Holy Spirit, to give up the comforts of home and to live among those who were in poverty and dying in India, to give of herself. Billy Graham, who, who publicly modeled what it was to be a Christian, lived a life that had to be hard for any human being. He's one of the few evangelists of our day, maybe the only one, our day that has not had some kind of shame brought down upon him because of something they did in their life or are doing in their lives that they got caught doing, but instead Billy Graham has made, made the sacrifice of living a life that's been set apart for God and being a holy, visible model of what it means to be a disciple, bringing the gospel to millions of people through his crusades and his tapes and his television, his, his uh, uh, evangelism, evangelistic programs. 